to talking about formatting text, and then we're going to talk about images. Um, formatting text, I'll probably go over a few things, but frankly, I shouldn't say it, maybe I'll turn the microphone off, but frankly, that's boring, all right? I was reading through that chapter, and it's like, I'm making notes for myself, and it's like, ah, oh, it's excruciating. Um, but yeah, you know, you need to know that it's there, right? You need to know that this is, you know, that there are tags that allow you to do things if you need to do them. So what we'll do is my suggestion will be, I'll talk about the basic concepts involved here and give a few examples, and then you can read through the books, all right? And, uh, and then we'll talk about images, all right? So I don't know if we'll do all of this today, you know, depending on questions and, and so on, but that's sort of the course for the next class or two, all right? Uh, our big focus last week was creating, um, you know, I, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, structural tags. In other words, tags that talked about how our page was structured. And we had an example last time, I think. Pulling it up here. See if it wants to open. Um, you'll notice that we have some of the basic tags that every page has on it. The doc type, which indicates the kind of HTML that we're using. Um, we noticed before that you didn't absolutely have to have that, but yet it's a good idea to have that in there because that, well, that, that's your best bet for the browser being able to interpret your code correctly is by identifying what you're uh, what, what, what kind of code you're running. And the particular doc type that we have here, that very first line indicates that it's HTML5. The browser knows from that that it's HTML5. All right. Uh, we then have our basic HTML tag that says, here is my document. There is only one HTML tag in your whole, and, and it goes around your whole document. So we have our start and end HTML tag. There then is a head and a body. And there's only one head tag and there's only one body. Think of the head as being information about the page. Um, the body being what's actually going to be displaying in the window. All right. Um, the title, for example, is one item that's required in the head. And that is uh, what's going to appear uh, on the tab, what's, what's going to appear on the title bar, what's going to appear on the task bar when you minimize uh, that. All right, our body then is divided into sections. And this is where uh, we were going over last time. And I introduced like four sections. A header, which is meant to be, you know, something that identifies your site, identifies your page, makes it very clear um, as to, you know, what this page and what this site is about. And the one thing that I mentioned is, you know, you can't, you almost can't be too obvious about it. You know, it should be very clear at a glance what your page is about and, and what your site is about. Um, don't think, oh, well, it's obvious people are going to know what it is. Well, I don't know. You know, obvious is a funny word, you know. People use the word obvious when they understand something, all right, uh, but it's not always that obvious to people that don't understand it. So, therefore... Uh, is important to to make it very clear, make it obvious. And in this case, I have a header tag, and I just put in an H1. Now, you could have other stuff in here, too. You could have H1s, H2s, and so on. You could possibly have a little paragraph that, that was like maybe a brief explanation of what your page was about. Um, you could have an image if your organization has a logo, you know. So anything that you would think of as like identifying your organization. Um, would be uh, in the banner. We then have a, a navigation section. And a navigation section um, consists typically of a series of links. 
And oftentimes those links are put into an unordered list, which is what I have here. So navigation, links. How do you get around the site? Um, it's important to make that very clear. It's important that you choose good names for your links. Um, and it's important that it's obvious that your links are in fact links. All right. Now, we're not doing too much with the appearance of the page right now. We're letting the browser defaults take over. But Later on, when we start putting CSS in, some of these things will become more relevant. Um, what I mean by names for your links, for example, I said this is selecting a camera. This is camera controls. This is Google. This is my second page. Um, shouldn't be something like link one, link two, link three, or something like that, because that won't be very useful in someone navigating their way around your site. All right. Um, we talked about being able to create links three different ways. One way is to create a link to somewhere else on your page. All right. And that is done by putting in a pound sign and giving a name, and that name corresponds to an ID on the page. So, in other words, where it says a href equals pound select. If you click on that, that will take you to the thing on the page that has an ID of select. If you want to get to the top of the page, that's actually pretty easy. You actually don't even need to define an ID. This takes you back to the top of the page. Just pound sign. So if I were viewing this in my browser and I was scrolling down, if I click top of the page, boom, it takes me up back to the top of the page. So that sometimes is a good idea. We also can have navigation to another one of our pages. And again, if we're assuming that everything's in the same folder, you simply need to put the name of the HTML file. Lastly, we could have a link to someone else's page out on the web. And um, the href then is the full address, including the HTTP colon slash slash. Typically what I do is I'll copy and paste. I'll bring up the page I want in the browser, then copy and paste the link over. Um, you can't just abbreviate and type in www.google.com because that really isn't the whole address. Your browser is smart, and if you just type in www.google.com, it knows it needs to put the HTTP in front of it. But when you're creating the web pages, you have to do things absolutely correct. Anyhow, that's the navigation section. We then have an article section where we have an article on the page. And then lastly, we have a footer section, which would be something that would appear at the bottom of the page. Could be contact information, copyright information, um, that sort of thing. Um, Is that where you would put, like, if you got some information from uh, other sources? Yeah, you could actually do that a bunch of different ways, but that would be one way that you could do it, is you could put it in the footer, almost like a footnote. Now, there's a couple of other uh, things that we haven't talked about, a couple of other structural tags that we haven't talked about that we'll talk about now. So we talked about article, nav, header, and footer. One of them is called a section. And is simply a start section tag. And an end section tag. Now, they mention in the textbook that it doesn't do you good to agonize about whether something is a section or an article. All right? You know, is this a section of the page or is this an article on my page? I don't know. You, in, some, in some cases, you can make an argument either way. The idea is, is that think about it, give it your best shot. What does it seem like to you? Would you identify this as a section of your page or an article? Um, don't worry about splitting hairs. Do it and you'll be okay. All right. Um, so, for example, in that previous example, I probably could have replaced the article 
tag with a section tag and things would work just about the same. The other thing is that um, there is an aside tag. An aside tag is used for sort of like a sidebar article. You know, if you're reading a book or a newspaper or whatever, there'll be typically the main article. Then often there might be like maybe uh, like a, a little side article that, that talks about like a related topic, but, you know, sort of off the, off the main topic. Here would be an example just from the book. There's a section on using preformatted text, and they have all their stuff. They then have this article, which is related to that topic, but like a little bit different slant on it. So they kind of put it, you know, it's not really part of the main section. It's sort of like, uh, you know, a, a comment, all right? Um, and you can see other examples of this in the book. In this textbook, they, they typically use that little tan uh, background for an aside. So yeah, it's related to this, but again, it's, it's not exactly, um, you know, it's like a little bit of a, of a, di a digression or, or a, a related thought. Question? Does it actually put it out in a sidebar? No. Okay. No. Uh, in other words, keep in mind that all these tags relate to um, the structure, what, what, what these sections of the page logically mean and what they represent. Everything about the way it's going to be looked, the way it's going to look or the way it's going to be formatted on the page, we're going to handle via CSS. Now I noticed in the textbook they've talked a couple times about CSS and I haven't really talked about that in class yet. We will probably be coming on that very soon where we talk about CSS and um, then we'll talk about styling it. But, for example, you know, we might want to make the main articles look one way and the side articles look another way. The obvious thing would be to m push the side articles to the side, right? Uh, the aside articles to the side. Or maybe you put a border around them or use a different background color or a lot of different ways that you could potentially style them. All right? One thing to remember is that... Um, the ta these tags that I've just said are HTML5 tags. Now, what does that mean? That means a couple things. First of all, if you look at older examples, they're likely not to use these tags. All right. Prior to HTML5, there was sort of one tag that served all these purposes, and that was the div tag. So if any of you have done web development before, or if any of you look in an example online, if you see the div tag, there was really only one tag that served all these roles. And the div tag simply meant a division of your page, a section of your page. And really that's what these tags are, right? These tags are for sections of the page. The banner, the, the navigation, articles, sections, asides, footers. The only difference between previous versions of HTML and HTML5 is HTML5, they've created a separate sort of structural tag for each section rather than using the div tag for everything. All right. So that, that's giving more precise meaning to the tags. Y you know, in, in HTML5, everything would be in a div. So if you looked at the code, what's that div for? Well, you'd have to dig in a little deeper. Here is obvious. Oh, what section of the page is this? It's the header. It's the navigation and so on. Um, Again, do keep in mind that, that um, there are more examples and there are more things in, in the book that I don't necessarily go over in class. The H group is, is one. Uh, I'm mentioning that just to say that I'm not really going to talk about that, which is kind of, uh, I don't know, 
kind of circular reasoning or self-contradicting or something like that. But um, you are welcome, of course, to bring questions to class on these things. But again, my idea as far as lecturing goes is it doesn't do me any good to like cover page by page by page because you have you bought the book, you can read it. It's a great book. Um, my job, I think, is to give my slant on the, on the similar or related information. Um, one other thing, if you look on page 88, <laughs> right after I said I'm not going to go page by page in the book, then I say, turn to page 88. <laughs> they talk about a role attribute. And this role attribute helps with accessibility of the page. And on the page 89 and 90, they talk about what some of those roles are. A role of banner, a role of navigation, a role of main, and so on. We'll spend more time talking about accessibility later on. Uh, in the course. Accessibility relates to people of different abilities and disabilities accessing your site. Probably the most um, obvious case of a disability that would affect your ability to interact with the page are people that are blind. All right? How does someone that is blind work their way through a web page? Well, there's actually special software that reads the screen to them. All right, and it's amazing what people can do. You know, when 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 people first see an example of this or hear about it, they 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 think that oh that that'll never work. But again, you know, what are they say necessity is the mother of invention. You know, if that's the only way you could interact with the web, you'd make it work for yourself, and that's what these people do. Uh, I I worked with someone that um the uh, you know uh, that was an intern at a place I work, a, a blind student that did virtually everything on the computer without, literally without having the monitor turned on a lot of the time. Because seriously, she'd come and she can't see the monitor, why turn it on, right? And occasionally she'd get stuck with something and she'd ask me to, to help her out and I'd have to go and turn on the monitor to see what was going on to explain what was that. But uh, it was amazing the stuff that she was able to do, all right? That's the notion of accessibility. There's things that you can do in your page to make it more accessible for people with dis disabilities. Now we'll talk more about this later on. Yes? These are the elements that I believe uh, federal government websites are required. Federal government websites, yes, are required. Other websites, you know, it's up to the courts to decide because there have been organizations that have gotten sued for uh, lack of accessibility and all that and that's one of those things that like, you know, it's probably best to, to, to take the effort and design your site to be accessibility. But definitely federal sites would, would need to be uh, accessible. The idea is, is if we can provide like some hints in our pages, that can help out this assistive technology that people use, such as screen readers and so on. Just like if we make some accommodations on our physical campus, we can accommodate people with disabilities. For example, ramps. Um, for wheelchairs instead of only having stairs. All right, that's an accommodation, right? You can have assistive technology, you can have a wheelchair, but if the campus isn't built with ramps and elevators and things like that in mind, then your assistive technology doesn't do any good. All right, so periodically throughout the class, and I probably will take uh, a, few se a few sessions to talk about it in more detail, um, we have the notion of accessibility of, of things that we can do on a web page. Question. There's a question there on page 88. The code, they show right there, um, identify new container mm -hmm. at the top. Yes. See, they put the role in with the header tag, and then lower it down, they put it in with the UID tag. I don't know if it's a place that's supposed to go, or then they show role equals main for the second portion. <coughs> Oh, they have it in the header tag and, okay. The, they put it in the div ID tag. Okay. 
Right. The, 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 the short answer and the question is, is if you notice in the example on page 89, the rule is in a bunch of different places. All right. And it's on a bunch of different kinds of tags. It's on a header tag, it's on a nav tag, it's on a div tag, and so on and so forth. The, the, the short answer is, is yes, it, it goes where it needs to be. In other words, if you have a section of your page that's a header, then, then that's the header section or the banner section. The nav relates to the navigation. Um, and then later on, they have a div and, it, you know, and that div really relates to a section and therefore um, they put it on the div. So yeah, it, it is where it needs to be. All right. In this case, in this example, I think what's confusing about this example is that they mix HTML5 tags with the, with the div tag. Um, if you were purely coding this in HTML5, then probably those two divs would probably be sections. All right. Or articles, yeah. Um, no, no, no. Well, you, you would put it where it made sense. Now, for example, uh, let's look at that, that second one where there's, uh, or the third one, where there's a div uh, ID of content, role equals main. What they're saying is everything in that div is considered to be part of the main content. So they put that, they, they put the main role on the div tag. Section and role equals main. Yeah. Now, to make a liar of me, as they, as they say, if you notice the sidebars, they handle exactly opposite. They don't put it in the div. I, I, I think their point is not to portray a consistent, coherent example, but to show some alternatives of ways that you can do it. Yeah. You could. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You could put it on anything that sort of groups sections of your page together. And by the way, just because um, divs are uh, previous to HTML5 doesn't mean you can't use them in HTML4. Now, one thing, a, a danger that we run into, and, and we ran into our first example of this in lab on Wednesday, and that is the idea of browser compatibility. All right, Especially given that we're working with some HTML5 tags, it's possible that some browsers especially older browsers, might not implement HTML5 correctly. All right. The specific problem that we ran into was a person tried to put uh, an ID on a section or on an article and then the link didn't work correctly. And they just moved the ID down to the H1 or H2 instead and then it did work. Um, the idea is, is your code is meant to be a, you know, uh, to describe the way your page looks like. And it's meant to follow the rules of HTML uh, and all that. And the browser ideally would display it the way that you've intended it. However, people that make browsers, people that code browsers are imperfect people just like we are, right? Not everything they've done is perfect. In addition, some of the problem comes in from the fact that the HTML5 specification is evolving. It's not a finalized, completed sec, uh, uh, a specification yet. People are still working on it. Which means that browser makers don't want to wait until the specification is finalized to start incorporating some of the elements into it. Neither do web designers. So it's kind of a case of moving targets and things happening simultaneously and things not necessarily being in sync. Because of that, and even in a perfect world, even after the, the specification is implemented, there's always bugs where the browser doesn't do the things the way that, that it's supposed to. And that's one of the most frustrating experiences for a web designer. You do everything that you're supposed to and it still doesn't work out right. You know, If you're doing a math problem, right? if you do the math that you're supposed to, you'll get the right answer. right? Um, ma uh, math is a lot more... Uh, theoretical though, you know, there are right and wrong answers. Uh, web development is very much a pragmatic real world with all of its problems, issues, and imperfections. Uh, because of that, and it's less important now, it will definitely become more important later on in the semester, but I did want to introduce it now, the notion of browser compatibility comes in. 
and it's good to test your web page in uh, multiple browsers. Now, we'll talk about some things that you can do if you're having problems in one browser or another. Uh, and we'll talk about that going forward. One thing to notice on page 88 is they have comments. Some people use a lot of comments in their code. Some people don't use so many comments in their code. That's kind of a style, personal choice. A comment uh, in code is where you explain what the code means, not for the browser to understand, but for anyone changing the page to understand. For HTML, and again, those of you that have done other programming, you know, there's comments are, are available in other languages as well. I don't personally see them as, as essential in HTML as I do in other programming languages, but people still like to use them. And again, so I'll leave that pretty much up to personal preference. I, I won't require you to put comments in, yet some people find them useful. They're for you, right? They're for you coming in after a long weekend and you can't remember um, exactly where you were at in the page to look at and, oh, okay, this is how this page is set up. Uh, or for anyone in, in, in a real life situation that's going to come in after you to make changes to a page. All right. I think that wraps up our loose ends from last week. What I'd like to do now is talk about text formatting. Now, the fundamental rule with this is you use the tags that we describe here to describe what the content means, not to get it to look a certain way. All right? For example, let's, let's look at two of the tags that we have. One of the tags that we're going to look at is the address tag. And that's covered on page 102. And that relates not really to the person's physical address, but like how to contact them electronically, like either through a link to somewhere or to uh, an email address. So if we look at page 102, we'll notice that in this article, they have, right about here, they have an address of the person that wrote the article, an email address. Notice that there's a link, and the link says a a href equals mail to colon, and then the person's email address. If you have that kind of link, that's a still a different kind of link that will open up your email client and allow you to enter an email for that person. So you can create a link uh, just for their email. Now that's in an address tag. All right. And notice that if it's in an address tag, if we look at the next page, it gets displayed as being in italics. All right. So let's go and let's create a page of our own because that might be a little easier to see.
Actually, let's go and let's go and enhance this one. I could say address contact. All right. So I have at the end of my article a address tag that puts how to contact me. And again, it could either be a link to like maybe my home page or it could be a, a, a email link. You know, let's say for example, I was a photographer and I was writing uh, an article for uh, an online pho uh, photography publication. All right. So they may say you can see Mike's work at and then have that. So it's just another way of contacting. Yes? Is that going to give you anything to click like that? Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I have the, the text between there. So let's go and save this. Now, I'm going to view this in Google Chrome because Google Chrome typically has pretty good um, HTML5 support. All right, so notice what it did. Notice it's in italics. Contact Mike Zellers at mzellers at lorraineccc.edu. And if I click on this link, it will open up my email client, whatever it is. There's probably not an email client set up on this machine, so we'll probably, yeah, it takes me to the office or Outlook uh, installation. Yes? Okay, so the Yes. Well, we're, we're, yeah. Exactly. Why, uh, the question was: Is why do we put it in an address? Why not just have a regular old link? And the answer is is twofold. Uh, or, or there's there's um, there's well, let's just give the answer. One of them is as, as the student mentioned, uh, CSS implications. We can then style. We can then make addresses look different than other links. All right. It is a good design rule that, that like things should look the same, different things should look different. So a regular link, you might want to look different than a contact link, all right, an email link. So by putting in the address, you can style it differently that way. So that's one reason. The second reason is a more abstract, more theoretical sort of reason, and that is, is you want your document to be marked up as accurately as possible for any number of reasons by, by specifying what each element on the page really, really, really means, all right, and doing that in a very precise way. That helps for styling purposes, like we've already talked about. That helps for accessibility purposes. That helps for future enhancements of web browser purposes. That helps with going forward to mobile device purposes. A lot of good things happen when you describe your page as precisely as possible. So would it work if I left off the address? Yeah, that link would still work the same. But you gain a lot of advantages by describing your web page. Again, they call it uh, semantically, all right? Whereas we use our tags to indicate what something means, 
all right, rather than just what we want it to look like. All right, so that's one of the tags that's, that's covered in the chapter, the address tag. Now, if you notice by default that that made the text in italics, all right? Now, let's say, for example, I want to put this in italics to emphasize it, all right? In other words, I'm not saying, believe it or not, some phones. I might be saying, believe it or not, some phones, you know, I'm emphasizing it. And I can do that in speech, right? But there's different ways to do that if you're doing it in text. Now, I might get the bright idea, well, gee, that address tag puts things in italics. So let me go and use the address tag here. Whoops. Yeah, I, I, I was looking at the word some and, I don't know, it's a Monday. All right. Well, first of all, it put it on its own line, all right? So that's a problem right off the bat. But even if we ignore that, even if we ignore the fact that that is in italics, or I'm sorry, that that's on its own line and say, hey, well, yeah, it worked. It put it in italics. Well, yeah, but we lied to our browser, right? We told it that the stuff in that address tag is someone's contact information, how you get a hold of them, all right? And it's not, all right? That's defeating all the purposes of using these things. All the great things that I said a minute ago that we get by using these tags to really talk about the meaning of the content, we lose if we lie to our browser and use these tags just to get the page to look a certain way. All right? So, the big lesson, and again, this is what I want to emphasize about this, ch this chapter. We'll go over some other examples of stuff, but the big lesson I want to emphasize in this is that you don't use these text tags to get the text to look a certain way. You use these text tags to really explain the meaning of the text, all right? Give cues to the browser that this is what this text is. And in this case, this is appropriate because the address, this is someone's address, someone's email address, where this is not someone's email address, all right? Instead, if we want to emphasize that, there's another tag for that, and that is the M tag. And if we look at that, it still gives us in italics, and we didn't lie to our browser because we put an M tag around that because we truly wanted to emphasize that word. We're not lying and saying, well, that's an address. Make it look like an address, and, and we'll be okay. So, for me, that's one of the big points of this chapter. Sure, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different things that you can talk about in here, but the main lesson of them is don't lie to your browser. All right? That's the main concept. Use these tags the way that they were intended. Because if you don't, then you're not really going to gain the advantage of using these tags. Now, one thing you should notice, that when I use the M tag, we got rid of the, the problem that it was on a different line. All right? I don't think I've mentioned the two different kinds of tags there are. But, so now is as good a time as any, because we noticed that we had two very different behaviors from these same, from, from, from two tags. All right? One is that it puts it on its own line. One doesn't put it on its own line, all right? The two
two kinds of tags that we have are called block and inline tags. The idea of a block tag is a block tag is, in, is on its own line. Whereas an inline tag is, doesn't give its own line. It's just smack dab in the middle of whatever's there. So, most of the tags that we've experienced so far are block tags. All right? The H1 is a block tag. The H2 is a block tag and so on. Section, nav, article, footer, those are all block tags. Paragraphs are block tags. All right. We've, I think, only encountered two inline tags so far. And those are the link tag, the A, and the M tag. So let's take a look at this to, to verify what I mean. All right. Notice that, again, M is an inline tag, which means that this text, sum, is going to appear in italics, but it's going to appear right next to, believe it or not. Believe it or not, sum phones. It's inline. Likewise, this link is an inline tag. All in one line. Whereas, notice each of these other tags the article, the H2, the paragraph, the H3, these are block tags. They each start on their own line. So it's important to know, um, you know, which are block, which are inline tags, because that, that's their default behavior. Yes? So isn't that, that would be relative, though? What do you mean like, relative? Like, No. No. That's going to be on its own line. That's going to break its own line. Yes. Yeah, an H1. It, it's, not, it's not where it is in the code. It's the fact that H1s, by default, are block tags, right? So like in this case, to, to answer this example, if I were to put H1 in here, now that's a misuse of the H1 tag, right? Because that's not really a header. That's a word that we want maybe bold or bigger or whatever, and there's better ways to do it, all right? But just for the sake of argument, if we put that in there, then you have a bunch of choices, okay? All right, let's run down through with our last five minutes some of the other important ones. All right, we talked about the M, which stands for F emphasis. And there's this brother. Well, I, I guess we depend on the way that we go. If we want to strongly emphasize something, we can say strong. And, and by default, this will make it bold. So, high end. No. Right. If we decided that the things that we wanted strongly emphasized, we wanted bold and italics, then we would do that via CSS. There is a site tag, site, C-I-T-E. Oops. So I could put
like where I got the information from. And it could just be text or it could be a link or whatever. And again, by default, and puts it in italics. Now again, we want to use these tags based on the meaning that we're associating with. So in other words, site is like the source of information. Address is how to contact the person. So even though they both look the same, you don't want to use them interchangeably because one means one thing, one means the other. The fact that they both look the same is, is for our, from our perspective, coincidental because we can change any of that um, via CSS. There is a block quote tag. If you have a long quote, You can use a block quote tag. And what that in does is that indents it a little bit. Um, if I were to have multiple lines, it would make a nice little block there. Typically, that's used for a, a quote of more than just a few words or a sentence, like you know, like a, a like if you're quoting like a paragraph from someone, you can put it in a block quote tag. And then you're likely to use a site tag underneath it to indicate where you got that from. Look through the chapter for some of the other things. There's a time tag. There is. Pardon me. Yeah, time tag is a little confusing. There is a mark tag, there's an abbreviation tag, a definition tag, subscript, superscript, insert, delete, and it goes on from there. So review those uh, in the book. Um, we'll pick up on Wednesday with a discussion of images, all right? Which are a lot of fun because now we can start giving some personality to our page instead of just having uh, plain old text. All right, we'll see you up in lab.